Macho Man. Thanks everybody for being here. Day four, Breakfast with Bob. From Conan, Huggles on the Rocks. My name is Bob Babbitt, brought to you by Master Spas. As fuels go longer, Hoka Let's Fly, Deborah Wetsuits, Forum Spots, Swim Goggles, Zoot Sports, Original Triathlon Brand, Quintana Roo, Premier Plus Sports, and of course, our Challenge Athletes Foundation. Our next guest, three-time Xterra World Champion. But to me, she's a rookie. She's here in Kona for the very first time at the young age of 50, racing as a pro. Give it up for Melanie McQuaid. Thanks, Bob. <laughs> Hello, rookie. I love being a rookie. You are the rookie. When we break down all this stuff, as a rookie, you're gonna have to help us carry all this stuff out. I like that. <laughs> all the, we're gonna haze you. So what are you, are you liking this? Oh yeah, no, I love it. Yeah, it's amazing. It's the vibe here. I think particularly since it's all women, the yes. vibe is just so rad. It's, it's pretty right. fun. Yeah, Get it's rid right. of those guys. We don't need them. Yeah, it's no attitudes. Everyone's just having no fun. No attitude. Ever. I was talking to one woman. She was swimming. She's been out here for 20 years, and she ran into another swimmer. And she goes, for the first time ever, they said, oh, sorry, excuse yeah. me. They were just like, nice, rather Sounds than like a get Canadian. out of my way. Was she Canadian, the person she ran into? Of course she's Canadian, <laughs> probably. Maybe. That's why she's so nice. And she said, sorry. Sorry, sorry. sorry. <laughs> so this year, we look at your Ironmans, and you got second in Ironman Maryland, and third at Ironman Coeur d'Alene, and then 70.3s, more like you know, 12th in St. George, 11th in Oregon. But you don't focus on the 70.3s. Not, no, not anymore. Like it's, it, all my primary goals were in the full distance. So, I mean, I don't, I don't need to make excuses. I actually think, you know, 12th in St. George was actually kind of a, a good result. Yeah. That was the championships. But I definitely think that there, there's a little bit of room for me to run a bit faster if I wasn't focused on the full distance, but I'm not. So, um, yeah, so those results are, are great for, and they, and they serve the purpose. Like St. George was just something to open the season. And um, I did Oregon because I did a pretty major change in my, in my bike fit before that race. It was only four weeks after I had done Coeur d'Alene. I changed my bike quite a bit, and so I decided to do that race. And it also was uh, a great way to get some information on races four weeks apart because yes. this is four weeks from Maryland. And Got so it. it was, I did try like a, like a training thing to go into that race that I felt was particularly un, like I didn't think it was that great. And so I did learn something from doing, doing that. Um, but de definitely the 70.3s are, are more of a training versus fact finding mission. Whereas my primary goals were all in the full distance. Last year I was actually doing the Ironman coverage for Ironman Wisconsin. And I was in Colorado in a, in a, in a booth doing the conference. And I'm freezing because you guys, it was a torrential downpour. I'm like, if anybody, is Brent McMahon, you know, it looked like, hey, what's a big deal? Uh, I should be wearing a tank top. And it looked like another Canadian, you, you're like, what's, what's, what are people complaining of? Ben Hoffman is like shivering. And you guys are like, yeah, this is every day. I should have brought my fenders. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's actually quite true. Yeah, I, th I think that... Um, there's weather isn't an excuse right you, you train for any condition and you dress for any condition and you just deal with whatever the the you know the race delivers and obviously wisconsin was you know like 10 for for the us like we were riding through 10 inches of water half the day so it's like almost 10 hours of like torrential rain and 50 degree temperatures that was just the race yes that so was you it just do it that's it <laughs> you just do it once you got the number on that's what you do exactly how have you had to change with age oh geez mindset mindset 100% um, I think you know back in the day when 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 I would um, go to races it was always like about um, whatever that performance was like right. what could I get out of this race like could I get a title um, could I, you know, get the win? Could I beat people? Um, could I do something special that I could get sponsors? You know, I was really all about what I could have from racing. Um, and then my mindset now is much more, what can I experience from racing? That's like, a great point. What can I learn from racing? Um, and even when I was describing, you know, like how I approach setting up my race season, like what can I learn from these different races that I put in? And, you know, it's pretty amazing that after 30 years this is my 30th year of racing, racing? wow yeah I, I probably learned more in the past three years than i've learned in every year of racing that i have because i am just so committed to that mindset 
And so it's just, it's been really great how, how quickly I'm absorbing information because I'm just so open to it. Are you, do you feel you're better now than you were? Because you transitioned from Xterra. Those are a couple of hour races. Then you're going to eight, nine, 10 hour races. Yeah. How hard was that? Oh, very hard. Yeah, and I think that I'm probably physically, like my genetics are, are much more towards what Xterra is, that stochastic effort. Because when I burst onto the scene in mountain biking, like I, I started mountain biking in I think 1993, and then like I made the national team the next year, a lot of my early results in races like the Cactus Cup, which yes. is like an iconic oh mountain God. bike race. Yeah. Like I won the short track of that race the first go. I won the Cactus Cup when it came to Whistler as like a fresh-faced newbie. And all of those races really rewarded the 20 minute short track, you know, or the fat tire crit and all this stuff, which is definitely what my physiology is like. And, and if I even look back at my mountain bike racing, it was the short track at Sea Otter that I won. It was like the Criterium at Redlands that I think I was second there. So like all these really short, fast races. And so that was like how I was built. Yeah. And Not Iron Man. No, it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't about Iron Man. When I, when I look at mountain biking getting in the Olympics in 96. Was that the goal? Oh, absolutely. Well, 96 was a bit too early for me. Like, I think I went with the national team to the test track for Atlanta, that was? Yes, yeah. Atlanta. Um, but, but then the next one, the 2000, was certainly on my radar. And um, I knew early in that year that I wasn't going to make the team. They didn't take me to world championships in Spain that year. That's sort of a hint. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> the writing is on the wall. Everybody who's going to the championship, <laughs> step forward, not so fast, Mel. We don't need you. Um, and at the, you know, the, the women's mountain bike team for Canada, I think just recently it's shifted, but the women's mountain bike team for Canada was the best in the world for 20 years. So, like, I was fourth on a team. Uh, like, two of the girls on that team medaled at that Olympics. Oh, my God. And so they were all really good. But, and I wasn't as good. Um, but what happened that year is I got left off the team, and so I was like, oh, damn. And so then I started road racing. And I actually made the road national team that year, and I went to France, and I raced the UCI World Championships. This is 2000. Yeah. Like a, a dinosaur age. Um, and so I went to that race. I'm, I'm like one of the last people. I'm the domestique on the team, so it's a grid, and it's France. And so like you line up on this grid, take off 800 meters down the road, and then you turn left. And then, of course, like a ginormous crash happens like 800 meters into this 120 kilometer race. I'm like out the back before the race even started. <laughs> Me and another girl on the team were just in the la like laughing group doing nothing for like the entire race. And I was like, forget this sport. I got to something I want a else. place where I can control my own destiny. Exactly. And so I was lucky that that year in 2000, um, the organizer of the Xterra race also organized the Hawaii Mountain Tour, which was a mountain bike stage race. Tom Kiley. Uh, it was actually Dave Nicholas that invited okay. us. He loved the mountain bikers because we were fun. And so he invited us over and was like, I have this race, you guys should come. And so it was me and like Leslie Tomlinson and Andreas Hessler, all these like OG mountain bike racers who are fun. And so we went to this, um, you know, off-road triathlon. And so of course I haven't trained for this. I've been in France falling on the ground. Any running background? No, no, I hadn't run in years. Swimming? Uh, swimming I did do like I think I knew I was going to be able to go to that race so I had about a month and a half of like masters swimming that I went to and I swam for a year and a half in high school okay so I, I could I could swim kind of um, but yeah I came second that year and so I was like and I won more money than I'd ever had in my entire adult life it was six grand and it was like like and, and at the time I was in cycling which was like fully not equal and so, and all of a sudden I had this opportunity to be a real professional athlete and, you know, that, the rest is history. I was done with cycling at that point. Yeah. And the growth of Xterra, I think a lot of that really in terms of the awareness, we talk about here, Dave Scott, Mark Allen, we were just interviewing Julie Moss, Kathleen McCartney, rivalries move the needle because media doesn't know anything about our sports, but they understand two people might not like each other and both want the same thing. Mm -hmm. You, Jamie Whitmore, I mean, I covered that rivalry for years. Mm -hmm. I loved it. Well, could you guys be friends back then? I uh, no, and and I think that I think that that goes back to like this mindset that I had in the past, where um, I, I think the mindset back then was it was a, a net sum game where there had to be somebody that won, and as a result, somebody else would have to lose. And I think that that mindset is so foreign to me now because you know I th I think pr it's a lot of it has to do with the fact that Iron Man itself is its own beast, and and you have to first conquer the race itself 
um, before you can start focusing on your competitors. Because if you don't take care of like what you need to do for the race, you're not going to have anything left to be competitive with other people anyway. So it comes down to like your own thing and doing your own best and then worrying about whether or not you're racing other people beside that. And so I think that my mindset for competition now is more that these amazing professional women are, are allies. They're, they're people that can help me to, um, to get the most out of myself on a race day. And, and I know that the professional women's field in Ironman specifically is just, it's so, it's so welcoming. And, and I know there's, there's a long list of women that I race that have sent me like essays on how to do this. Like just this is what, the the first person who sent me one of those essays was Meredith Kessler, yes. who has just been an, an, an amazing and most welcoming friend in the sport, um, and so she continues to be a great ally of mine. But then there was like Beth McKenzie. I was like, Beth, how do you run that fast? She's like, Here, here's my training from the like, ten ten weeks before a race, and like so like it just that's what this. Um, women's professional field is like it's a sisterhood it's a sorority it's like it's just a really welcoming and wonderful group of people so how can you have really rivalries when everyone kind of just wants you to succeed and and yet you know you don't have to you, you can be in a race course doing your best trying to beat people and not have any negative feelings towards of course not you don't need to be like that and I think that that mindset um, is pervasive in the pro women's field, which is why the level continues to rise. Like, I think if everybody helps each other to get a lot faster, then all of a sudden everybody's going to get a lot faster. Everybody wins. Yes. At the end of the day, you're racing the course and you're racing yourself. Yeah. Right? And, when, and it's just going to play itself out. Yeah. Being angry or, or bitter or chippy at somebody doesn't make you faster. It never does. No. And, it, and you don't want to be on an island all by yourself. <laughs> and, I, and I feel like when you're like that, when it's all rivalries and everybody's an enemy, then, then you're all by yourself. And, and, um, and it goes back to that mindset that I said about experiencing. And it's, it's a much more fun experience when, when you have friends and you have like friendly um, interactions with people yep. the whole time. Like the whole experience itself is that much more rewarding when you're just in that kind of positive environment with everybody. So when you're out there on races, this is your first time. <laughs> Have you enjoyed, and it's funny because uh, when you talk about heat, you've won three titles in Maui. You, you know heat. <laughs> you, you've, you've dealt with it before. So being here, does the heat intimidate you? Does anything intimidate you? Oh, I think that you have to respect it. It's, yeah. it's a thing. Um, and, and yeah, like I think when I first was thinking about this race, I... And this goes back maybe to like 2018, 20, even 2019. I was sort of like, well, I never need to go there. It's too hot. And so I didn't really want to go. Um, but then it, it became this race that wasn't in, on my resume. You know, I've kind of been to it. We, we just discussed a few of the world championships yeah. that I've been to, and this wasn't one of them. And so it became like one of my primary last three goals as a pro was to, was to race here. What are the other two goals? Win an Ironman and go sub nine. And I did go sub nine in Maryland, but that one doesn't really count. Short swim. It was a little bit short. Yeah, I still think that I had a lot of time to swim the rest of that swim to still get under. Oh my nine God, hours. you were eight oh seven. Yeah, but still, yeah. it's still okay. not valid. I have to keep racing. Um, so yeah, this. so those were the three goals, and um, and yeah, and so when I so I never really wanted to come because I thought it would be too hot, and it was actually my partner Mike who's like, "What are you talking about? You won three world championships in Hawaii," yeah. and and I I think that that's true and. For, but with all of those wins that I had, I also had some epic fails, <laughs> epic failures. Yeah. And so... Which the, year was the Leslie Patterson? 2011. 2011. Eight minute lead, passed out, couldn't get to the finish line. And you were how far from finish? Oh, I was 30 yards. Oh, 30 yards! Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we should call Julie Moss back. <laughs> <laughs> it was uphill. That's why if it had been like flat, you I could have made out. it. I could have crawled, but I couldn't, I had no balance, so I couldn't get up this hill. So oh my whatever. God. Anyway, so I think that the difference is that back then, um, we, don't, we didn't have the benefit of all the sports science that we have right now. When the Tokyo Olympics um, were arriving, the, the science community just went all guns a-blazing to figure out how athletes could perform in that kind of heat and humidity. 
And so us as a coaching community, and I consider myself part of that coaching community, we now have access to a whole bunch of science on that that right. explains like how to best prepare for those conditions. Whereas back in like 2000 to 2011, we were guessing. Always guessing, yeah. yeah, no idea. Yeah, and so there was years where I got it right and did really well, and there was years where I didn't do it right, I tried something different and it was a failure. Well, the and deal so, is you gotta know your own metabolism, you gotta know what you're, you're dealing with, and back then we, there was no way to test it, we didn't know. Totally, and I even think like sports nutrition, salt testing, all that stuff, that was not a thing nope, back then. So, so now we just have so much more data and, and so many more like, um, resources to use to be better in these conditions, which is why people are going faster. Yes. Um, but I just think that, like, I have a decent plan for this race that starts with pacing, <laughs> and we'll see what that results in. Mel, I love chatting with you. Always such a pleasure. Have a good time, rookie. I'm going to love it. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> you might be rookie of the year. You never know. <laughs> Pancho Man, take us out. Watch a man, everybody!